but people don't sit around and talk about features, advantages, benefits, or USPs. What they do talk about and share are stories. And fundamentally, that's part and parcel of that quest for your own identity is you can't create that without knowing fully your own story. Can you, and here's the trifecta I use, can you discover, tell, and then live your own story? Because you got to be able to live it in the end. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now, here's your host, Matt Lyles. Hey, do you ever wonder why one store, one bakery, one bookshop, one shoe store, one restaurant will have a line of customers out the door and around the block while a perfectly good competitor offering similar products at a similar price sits across the street almost empty? Do you ever wonder why some brands become the top of mind choice in an industry when their competitors may offer a better product at maybe even a better price? These are the brands that no longer have to do that much work to draw in customers. They simply have fans who continuously come to them in droves. These are the brands that really stand out. They're the ones who have become irresistible. But how can you do that in a crowded world when your customers are bombarded with competing and distracting messages and experiences every day? Luckily, there's an answer, and I get to discuss it this week with Gare Maxwell. Gare is an international keynote speaker, author, and brand strategist. He's the host of the top-rated podcast, The Leadership Standard, produced with TEC Canada, and he's the author of Big Little Legends, How Everyday Leaders Build Irresistible Brands. It's out this week. And Gear loves music as much as I do, especially Van Halen. We actually kick off the conversation with some valuable brand lessons from the late, great Edward Van Halen. So here it is. Here's my interview with Gare Maxwell. Hey, Gare, how are you? Welcome to the show. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, Matt. I uh, love what you're doing with this podcast. And uh, before we went on, you were telling me about uh, a little bit about the origin of it. I think it's just fantastic what you're doing and having these conversations that I think people are really craving now, especially when they can't travel as much. I think you're right. And like I was telling you earlier, This podcast was not originally part of my business plan, and it came out out of COVID, you know, where we were all sitting around and I thought, well, what does this make possible? Hey, here's an opportunity to interview lots of people who are wanting to get their message out. And then it turns out I get to talk to people who are so much smarter than me. It's like every week I'm having a free hour long coaching session. We'll reserve judgment till after this conversation, but we've got so much to talk about. Where would you like to begin, my friend? I mean, I've been looking forward to this one. Me too, for a number of reasons, and which is why I know we want to talk about Big Little Legends, your new book. Congratulations. But before we get into that, a little over a year ago, you posted a tribute video where you talked about Eddie Van Halen, and this was a little after his passing, and it was in inspirational, emotional tribute video. But at the same time, you talked about a lot of the lessons that we can all learn from him as far as how to be legendary. Can you tell me about that and those lessons? Yeah, well, thanks. It's funny you say that because that's a story. Even though he passed just over a year ago, it was uh, October 6, 2020. That story's not going away about that specific video. And maybe Matt, it helps if I 
tell you a little bit about the inspiration that created it in the sense oh, that, please, yeah, yeah, for me, for me, Van Halen, 1978, Harrison Trimble High School. That's the real soundtrack of my entire life right there for the past 42 years, now 43 years. Okay. Wow. And so it was like, by the time I was in my middle teens and late teens, Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and Deep Purple and Kiss had already been around. Right. Right. They'd already established themselves. And I jumped on the train while it was already moving, you know, and I love those bands. But for me, Van Halen, I've been on that train since it left the station. Like somebody get me a doctor, man. I was all in from day one. Right. I was like the first kid in my high school with that vinyl album. When we dropped the needle on that sound effect that opened running with the devil and then it segued into eruption and then the jet plane called you really got me. I mean, that's it. Right. That just grabbed me from that moment. Never let go. All right. So I got the phone call from my son, who's also a Van Halen diehard. Oh, fun. Yeah. And it was like, dad, Eddie passed away. What? Sorry. I like, I'm recreating it (laughs) in my own mind. Right. I know exactly where I was. Right. When he called. Wow. Eddie passed away. I didn't know he was ill. Right. Because they kept it pretty hush hush. Right. And so here I am. And you can imagine this. I'm doing this thing called leaders and legends. That's what I write about. That's what I talk about. My blog, Matt, is leaders and legends, right? And there was something that I can't not do this story. I have to do this story. This icon that we've loved and admired for so long is gone. I just did it because I felt it was a story that I had to share for no reason other than to just say, hey, you've earned it. And, And that's it. When I look back, I mean, we talk about it in the video and some people have really responded it with such emotion and depth of feeling. And here's the thing, Matt, I'm getting today more comments, more shares, more traction, if you will, on this video now than it did when it was released. Oh, yeah. Over a year later, I can tell you specifically how this has gone in terms of numbers in the sense that if anyone's curious... Up until, I would say, October 6th of this year, so the one-year anniversary, I'm going to guess, Matt, we had maybe, what, 4,000 views, maybe 4,500, okay? But right now, as you and I do this podcast, we're up over 12,000 all of a sudden. It's tripled in the last three weeks, and I honestly don't know where it's coming from. That's interesting. It is, isn't it? Wow. That's like an exponential increase. You know, so that one year mark, 4,000, 4,500 views, that's great. But then not even a month later, three times that amount. Right. And it just reminds me yet again, and I hope everyone listening today, when you post content on the internet and it's got depth and meaning and a real story behind it, nobody knows when or how it's going to ripple through the universe. Nobody knows. I don't know. But I know this. If you don't put your best foot forward and actually create content that matters, nobody will ever know. And for me, that's what Edward Van Halen was. It was something that matters. It mattered to me. And I felt there's other people that got to feel the same way. And then and when I look at it through the lens of something that which is legendary, There's some very transferable, very relevant lessons. Number one, he created his own category of one. So in the work that I do in terms of creating irresistible brands, create the category of one. Be in your own space, nobody else's. I remember when Eddie and the band came out, he was the only guy that invented his own guitar, for crying out loud. Richie right. Blackmore and Jimi Hendrix played Fender Stratocasters, and Ace Freely and Jimmy Page <laughs> were playing Les Pauls. But Eddie had this, it was the coolest thing. If I yeah. slip into my. Like, how you know, did he do that? How did he do that? 
And it was all striped up. Like he really was his own category that way, not just with his equipment, but then anyone who ever heard that solo called Eruption knows how much it redefined what people thought was even possible with the instrument. So number one, he did create his own category of one. Number two, he was a student of the craft. Not just Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, we're talking 100,000 hours or more away from the spotlight, but still immersed in his craft, trying to learn it and draw more out of it than even he thought possible. When you think of that boyish grin or his ridiculously <laughs> sick solos, Right. He was still a kid at heart. And even though he was in his 60s when he passed, for me, I kept seeing this guy's like he's six years old, but he was, in my view, the eternal student who became the master. So even in the later years, well, I, I say later, like the second phase of Van Halen with Sammy Hagar, he was still learning and experimenting with new sounds. It wasn't just the same old, same old. Like there were new sounds he was figuring out along the way. That's number three, right? And you saw the video. It's the willingness to experiment, which I think right. anyone listening today, it's not just knowing you want to create your own category and be a student, the eternal student, but that requires that willingness to experiment. And imagine this, when you know the history of Van Halen as deeply as you and I do, I mean, he's the ultimate guitar gunslinger, right? And you've got yeah. David Lee Roth leaping off drum risers all over the world, and this is the ultimate party band. And But can you imagine the ex level of experimentation it took to go into a very uncertain place where the greatest guitar hero of his generation, the, certainly the greatest since Hendrix and Clapton, he wants to use keyboards? You're going to take the weapon out of his hand and use keyboards on this song called Jump? I mean, think about it. Yeah. You know, Hendrix, with due respect, I don't know that Hendrix and Clapton or Page or any of the traditional guitar heroes ever dared to go that far. And to your point, let's bring it into Sammy Hagar era, the piano chords and melodies around right now. Wow. I mean, I saw more musical sophistication. They weren't the Pasadena backyard party band as they were with David Lee Roth, but they went into other areas. And I think that experimentation kept Van Halen relevant for well over two decades with two different lead singers. I mean, the third singer didn't quite work out, but that's not the point. The point is, how many others do you know that have that kind of career, that kind of staying power with two different lead singers? I know there's a couple out there, but off the top of my head, I can't think of them. Yeah. It doesn't really work. And I don't think that he would have been as legendary. And I don't think Van Halen would have been as legendary had he done only one of those three things. So maybe he was just always a student of his craft, but if he didn't experiment, it wouldn't have been the same. Or if he had tried experimenting without being a student of his craft or being the category of one, I don't think anybody would have trusted him enough to allow him to take those experiments and to make those risks. That's a very, very good point. I used to do this in live seminars. I don't do it anymore live because I've noticed it chews up a little bit of time and plus the data has already come back. We already know right. what the data is saying. So right. you don't need to beat a dead horse. But I've asked well over 2,000 people to define a legend. It's one of those strange words in the English vocabulary where it's kind of like, you know what, when you see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you can't really pinpoint it. It's hard to really define it. So I started, when I was in the early, early stages of researching this book, I started asking all the live audiences I was in front of, and then I started to correlate all the answers. And so can you just imagine if you ask literally thousands of people to come up with five, six, or seven human qualities that define what a legend is, human qualities, human characteristics. Doesn't take long, Matt, before you realize people will give you like four to 500 different human qualities and characteristics. Hmm. When you separate them all out and really look at them and start to categorize them, there are four main things 
that just are so consistent as we, the mere mortals, how do we define that which is legendary? And I challenge anyone listening right now. I mean, you could think about it. Think about what you think is a legend. It could be a real person like we were talking about, Edward Van Halen. It could be a brand. It could be a historical figure, someone from history or, or fictional. doesn't matter what it is. Could be a painting. Could be a painting. It could be lots of things, but yeah. define legendary. Yeah. And assign human qualities to that. And so you could take that, and what we saw in our research was four overarching themes. Number one, growth mindset. That was number one, growth mindset. And that acknowledges the research that Carol Dweck did on the subject of her book, which is called, ironically enough, Mindset. And mindsets are essentially one of two things, growth or fixed. And yeah. what I love about Carol Dweck's work is that she researched this and has the data on over 20 years of research out of Stanford. And she's clearly defined what a growth mindset really is. Eddie Van Halen, who we've already talked about, definitely reflected a growth mindset with his willingness to experiment and be the student. Those are part and parcel of having that growth mindset. Number two is aspirational ideas. So if you look at Steve Jobs, Gandhi, Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, all trying to make the world a better place. Eddie Van Halen, Matt, was making rock and roll safer and more exciting for guys like you and I. Yeah. So aspirational ideas or products or services, right? And what's interesting is that I think a lot of times when it comes to the first instance or when someone first starts talking about that aspirational idea, most people won't believe them. Most mm. people will say, yeah, okay, I get it, but I don't think you can really get there. I don't think that can really be done. And what we found, though, again, this is more than 2,000 people we studied in different seminars and live workshops all over North America is the people are looking for that. That's the people will not assign or confer legendary status on a critic. Explain that further. Well, there's a lot of people and we know, especially with the emergence of social media as, <laughs> as such a platform, right. there's a lot of people that are spreading a lot of different stories out there, but Unless they're aspirational and unless they're really designed with noble intent for the greater good, we, the public, don't see them in terms of through the lens of that which is legendary. Oh, wow. Okay. If I saw it otherwise, Matt, that's what I would tell you, but that's not it. <laughs> so, I mean, to be sure, let's just say with the recent space travel, Branson, Bezos, Elon Musk. They're all experimenting right now with space. Yeah. And they're all getting criticized, too, in some quarters, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Right. What are multi-billionaires doing with this uh, technology? And they should be putting their money elsewhere. Well, yeah. last time I checked, number one, they earned it, so they get to decide what they want to do with it. That's number That's one. True. But number two, how is this different? And this is why I love talking about legends and studying the origin of legends and what makes them irresistible. How do we know this isn't traveling around the oceans back in 1492 when Columbus was setting sail? Can you imagine the number of critics Columbus would have had? Oh, of course. Think about that. Hey, Columbus, that money that you're spending doing this traveling to find a better route to the Indies, you could take that money and you could feed a number of less fortunate people with that. It's the same argument as when you break it down. Yeah. We don't know what they're going to find or not find out there. But the very fact that they're out there trying to find something, to me, checks the box called aspirational. No different than Columbus or here in Canada it was Jacques Cartier and Samuel de Champlain. Like some of the early explorers right. had to come from Europe and different parts of the old world to discover the new. That's how it worked 500 plus years ago. Why would it be any different? So when I talk about these things in terms of a growth mindset 
and then aspirational ideas, the third thing that's common to all legends is change. In other words, you either initiate change or you embrace it. Either one. Nothing legendary will be built from those who resist change, dig in their heels and refuse to see where the future is heading. Ask Blockbuster how it worked out or Kodak or Sears or some of the other cautionary tales out there, but that's a big part of it. And then the fourth thing, very quickly, and I'll let this land on you and let's see how it you know, <laughs> rolls around your cranium out there in Nashville City, Music City, the home of hot chicken, by the way. I love um, hot chicken. Oh, man. We could go on a whole segue on hot chicken. But my point is this. Legends do the hard things. Yes, absolutely. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. That's it. It's hard. It's supposed to be hard to achieve that level, right? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, total sense. And I think along with doing the hard things, I think there comes a realization and those that are legendary understand that it's not just doing something hard for a short period of time. No, it's doing the hard things for a long time, knowing that it may take you decades. It may take you much longer than you'd really like for it to take for your work to become significant. Right. And that's the long view. And we really cover that in the book in terms of there's a whole chapter on that. That's right. Yeah. It's about playing the long game. And it's understanding, are you the kind of leader that is willing to plant seeds and grow trees? And you may never sit under the shade. You might not live long enough to sit under the shades provided by those trees. But that's how this works. And I think that separates people that are legendary or people that have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, people that focus on the hard things for a long time, recognizing that I'm not going to be the one that sits in the shade under this tree, mm. but I know a lot of people are going to be able to enjoy this shade. And that's what I'm working for. I'm not working for myself to be able to enjoy the shade. I'm working so that others can enjoy the shade. Yeah. This is not the hustle to make the quick buck. That's not what this is, right? You're building it from a brand perspective anyway which is what I write about and speak of, you're building it knowing you're trying to create this thing that will far outlive you. It's kind of worked for Nike and Bill Bowerman. Yeah, creating a legacy. Yeah, absolutely. So you got growth mindset, aspirational ideas, embracing change or even driving change, and then doing the hard things. So I'm curious, how can people go about changing their mindset, changing their habits so that they can focus on those characteristics? That's a great question. And ultimately, I think this opens up an interesting conversational thread. It all begins with knowing deeply who you are. And let's just use this in the context that I write about, speak about, and consult on. First of all, it has to do with the language of brand. And I got to say it yet again. I say this to every audience. Your brand is not your logo. Correct. It's just not. Yeah. It's the distinctive identity that shapes public perception. And that's what enhances your reputation. So how can you create something truly legendary and do any of these lofty aspirational things we talk about unless you know deeply who you are in terms of your identity, like what separates you from everybody else? And here's the question that's the stumper. Who are you beyond your products and services in terms of your identity? And I developed that question, Matt, as a way to acknowledge what Simon Sinek start with why. And Simon, I'm sure you're familiar, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Right. And the whole world, though, when you go to the home pages of websites, I've studied well over 7,000 websites, most in the B2B category, and all you ever see is this is what we do, this is how we do it. You don't see 
the underlying reasons why. And great brands and some of the legendary brands in the world, when you think of Patagonia or Apple or Nike, Disney, they've got this bedrock of values. In other words, their why, but beyond that, they actually know who they are beyond the products and services they offer. So for me, it's very much about an inward journey first before outward. And the first stop on that journey is that little place called identity. And that's really the inspiration. Big part of the inspiration around Big Little Legends is how do you dig into an identity that only you can possess and then share to the rest of the world. And I think too many companies focus more on their what. They don't even know to focus on their who. They focus on this is what we provide. This is what we do. These are our features. This is why our features are better than our direct competitors. And for the most part, the customer really doesn't care. Yeah, well, exactly. When was the last time any customer sat around talking with other customers, talking about XYZ company as having, you know, they've got a great USP. Yeah. No one in the real world talks like that. True story. Right. What I always explain to my audiences, and I speak to a lot of business audiences, what I tell them is no one, like the features, advantages, benefits, that's meat and potatoes, that's table stakes. But people don't sit around and talk about features, advantages, benefits, or USPs. What they do talk about and share are stories. And fundamentally, that's part and parcel of that quest for your own identity is you can't create that without knowing fully your own story. Can you, and here's the trifecta I use, can you discover, tell, and then live your own story? Because you got to be able to live it in the end. Because if you don't live it, people will hear you tell that story. And then if you live a different story, they'll walk away like, well, I do not trust that brand. They say their story is this, but I see them doing this. I don't trust them. Goodbye. You got it. I think that's why it's really important. And a lot of brands will take this extra step. They'll define what their identity is who they are, but they'll also define their anti-identity, who they are not. You talked about Patagonia, and Patagonia is pretty clear on who they are not. That helps them to really solidify and really define to their team members, these are the types of actions, these are the types of things that we will not do as a company mm -hmm. compared to what we do focus on and who we are as a company. And so whether it's Patagonia on a mission to save Mother Earth or whether it's Red Bull or some of those classics we mentioned like Nike, Apple, Ferrari. Yeah. But even they're all, shall we say, in the stratosphere of the greatest brands in the world. What we wanted to do with Big Little Legends is how do you take the same principles that used by everyone from Lululemon to Led Zeppelin? <laughs> apply those principles of brand building to, let's say, a small to medium-sized business. And I define small to medium as anywhere from basically a billion dollars in revenue and down. Anywhere between, you know, 10 million and a billion is, to me, small to medium. There you go. Yeah. And especially for those who don't have that advertising budget to right. really drive all the brand awareness. Right. Exactly. My point and what we've discovered for many years now is that you can be in the middle of nowhere. And because of social media and because of wonderful platforms like YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn and some of the different platforms out there, you can create a brand story that has no ending. That's one of the things that I talk about extensively in the book. How do you create a brand story with no ending? Nike did it with three words. Three words tell their whole story and answer the question. And everyone knows those three words. Just do it. How long can they produce content anchored to that statement? They can go to infinity. Infinity and beyond. <laughs> right, right. Was that Buzz Lightyear or whatever? Yes, yeah. That's what Nike's proven. 
And I don't think it's an accident that every time I look, Nike's brand valuation is always more than double their top four competitors, which I find astonishing when you consider that in 1964, when Bill Bowerman and Phil Knight started this thing on $1,000 startup capital and a handshake, I mean, at the time, their German-based competitors would have been billion-dollar behemoths. Nike was very, very small when they started. So was Disney. So was Apple. I had the good fortune of, of standing outside that garage at 3022 Chris Drive in Los Altos, California. Wow. I talked, yeah, no, I talked to employee number four. It's all part of our Leaders and Legends series going back a couple of years. That's another video, Matt, that people keep watching. The leadership legacy of Steve Jobs. Well, you know, I'm standing in front of that garage and I'm speaking with someone who was there, right? When it happened, sharing with me insights that are not out there in the zeitgeist. Yeah. But it helps to have that understanding of for anyone listening today, never lose sight. Nike, Apple, Disney, Led Zeppelin, they all started from the same place. Zero. They all started there. But it's recognizing, wait a sec, just because we start there doesn't mean we have to finish there. And what's great is that the lessons that we learn from them they're timeless lessons that you can use going into the future. It doesn't have to be, well, this was just a product of the time. Right. You can do this. If you take these lessons and instill them into your business today, you too will become legendary. Well, at least you'll have a shot at it. There's no guarantee. Right. Yeah. right. But at least you're going down a road that's worth following in my view. Otherwise, you follow a road that leads to ordinary and blending in with the rest of the pack. A great example of this would be the origin story of where did all these counterintuitive theories come from? Like I said, we've been doing this for a long time, but if you want to isolate that place in time, and that's one of the things we do in the book, we isolate the place in time in all 12 chapters where the world literally tilted on its axis in favor of that particular brand. So it doesn't matter whether it's the Cafe Dumont in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the heart of the French Quarter. It doesn't right. matter whether it's Pike Place Fish Market out there in Seattle, right? It doesn't matter. When you do the research, you can always find, Matt, that someplace the world's going to tilt on the axis. For the, the origin story of Big Little Legends, it comes from a guy in Eastern Canada, and I met him in 2002. His name is Jim. And when I met Jim, he had five employees, maybe a part-timer. Uh, they were doing about a million two, maybe a million three in annual revenue. And they were selling an interchangeable product. Now, the caveat, of course, is he's in the worst category on planet Earth in terms of public perception and reputation. Not a lawyer, though. You got to go further down the totem pole. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, they even made a movie about this in like the late 70s with uh, Kurt Russell, I think. Used cars. You got it. Yeah, he's so he's below. Jim is below lawyers and politicians on the totem pole called credibility. However... Jim and Donna Gilbert, the husband and wife team, did not fit the stereotype. Right. Not at all. In fact, are you ready for it? Matt? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The two of them are the nicest, kindest, most generous, soft-spoken people you'll ever meet. In fact, they would be characters right out of Seinfeld. They'd be low talkers. Yeah. Close talkers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, but they're low talkers, too. They're, they're very quiet. I'm just saying. They are quietly generous. They're like Jim Gilbert is kind of like a Latter-day Santa Claus and Walt Disney all rolled up into one. That's him. And he was like that on the day we met. I'll tell you something on the day we met. I find out that for years they had been doing handmade, handwritten birthday cards for their customers. Oh, wow. Right, Matt. Like who else would do that? Yeah, nobody. 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 
there. See, nobody was going to do that, right? So we meet in 2002, and it wasn't until 2006 when we kind of half by accident, but also half intentionally stumbled onto this bigger idea. And we never changed the product. We never changed the price. We didn't do anything that a lot of folks talk about in marketing. We didn't worry about target demographics or USP. Help me out, Matt. What's some of the other language that they kick around these days? Oh my goodness. I have removed myself from that industry for two years. And so I've forgotten a lot of the jargon. Reasons to believe. I know that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't even think about all that, but here's what we do. And I'll condense the story for the benefit of our listeners. Right. What we did is we just told a whole new story and we never talked about the products. It was so revolutionary because think of the car business. Think of the, at the local dealership level. What's oh, the typical yeah. car ad sound like? I mean, it's loud, it's fast talking, and it's talking about this model, this model at this price, this much down. And then at the very end, there's like all the legal terms on your monthly payments. Right. Better quality, better selection, better service, better value, better prices. Yeah. Today, today. <laughs> right. 0.9% financing. Like You get the whole thing, right? So yes. just like we talked about with Eddie Van Halen, if everybody zigs, what do you do? You zag. Yeah. That's it. Okay, so everyone does it one way, you go your own. And in the case of Jim Gilbert, what we did is we went on the radio in September of 2006. And we told 30 second stories about Canada's huggable car dealer. Yep. He's the Casanova of customer focus. He's been called the Romeo of roadsters. By golly, some call him the McDreamy of drive. Stop by at Jim Gilbert's <laughs> and get your daily dose of hugtonium designed to improve your love affair with your car and your libido. <laughs> but not even talking about the cars. Not even talking about the cars. We had a whole series of those types of story-based ads that we ran for literally years but we saw traction within six weeks because you know yourself, if you've got complete strangers going out of their way to approach a guy selling used cars and asking for a hug, you know you're on to something. We knew then it had appeal, mass audience appeal. People cared about the story. What really put it over the top was the wisdom from Donna Gilbert. It wasn't me. It wasn't Jim. And she said, and you'll appreciate this, couldn't just talk about being the huggable car dealer. We had to be the huggable car dealer. Right. What this illustrates is the gap between in business and life. There's a lot of people who talk, but then who's actually going to do it? You know? Yeah. Right. Anyone can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? And so the huggable car dealer, that story, that identity that I spoke of earlier, Matt, well, that became the springboard into something no one could have predicted. It's a complete original. Dozens of teddy bears became hundreds of teddy bears all over that place. Mascots, merry-go-rounds. There's a two-kilometer nature trail to go walk your dog. Get your popcorn ready because if Walt Disney was to conceptualize what a used car lot looks like, this is it from Fredericton, New Brunswick. Proof is in the pudding, as they say. That business by 2020 employs 38 people and did north of $50 million. It's grown at an enormous rate, steadily, consistently, since we changed not the product or the pricing, but the story and the identity that has allowed them to gain a most favorable reputation in the marketplace. Certainly one of a kind original. Well, they took what is a very undesirable transaction and turned it into a desired, remarkable experience. You got it. But story was the key to the whole thing, yeah. right? And without that, I shudder to think where Jim and Donna's enterprise would have been had they followed the more, shall we say, traditional data-driven mechanical aspects around marketing instead of a brand strategy that started with, we're going to come 
create an identity that nobody else has. They would have been like every other car dealership, and they may have survived. They may not have survived. Nobody in business wants to simply survive. You want to actually thrive. Right. And they never would have become what's happened, which is truly one of Canada's great small business success stories. I think a lot of people love those stories, but they're everywhere. If you look hard enough, they're everywhere. People love that Pike Place story out in Seattle. I'm sure you know some stories yourself of these small businesses, but have this mighty impact and this magnetic appeal with their brand. And what we found out for researching the book is that there was too many of them to put in the book which probably means there's going to be a second book two or three years down the road. There you go. Yes. Big Little Legends 2.0. Did you know that in addition to my podcast and my articles, I speak to audiences all over to help them simplify their customer experience and simplify their employee experience? I've spent the last few years leading a crusade of simplicity across the globe. If you want a winning brand, you have to provide a simple experience to your customers and to your team members. Whether it's a live event or a virtual event, I'd love to partner with you and teach your audience how to do just that. With over a decade in marketing, I know how to hook and captivate an audience. And as a speaker, I know how to connect with that audience. Along with my lessons, I use stories and humor to keep everyone engaged and inspired. Then they leave with the knowledge and next steps to transform their business. As an event planner, you're managing lots of details to give your audience the most memorable event. The last thing you need is a speaker who will make your event memorable for all the wrong reasons. Not only will I leave your audience energized and inspired, I'll make it easy for your team to work with me. Hey, if I've built my brand around simplicity, then you know I'm going to make it simple for you. When you visit mattliles.com slash speaking, you'll find everything you need to know, including details on my topics, promotional materials, and most importantly, a link to connect with my team so we can book your event. So visit mattliles.com slash speaking. I can't wait to help your audience brand out from the crowd. So Garrett, one of the other stories in there that I love because I can relate to this is Cafe Du Monde. Yes. I have eaten beignets from Cafe Du Monde for decades upon decades. And and every time that I'm in New Orleans, I will eat there. But I've got to say that I think that Cafe Beignet, which I believe is on Royal Street, I believe their beignets actually taste better. Mm Mm-hmm. So when I'm in New Orleans, I'll get some beignets from Cafe Beignet at least once. Right. But I will go to Cafe Du Monde at least once a day, sometimes even twice a day when I'm visiting it. So what is it about Cafe Du Monde that drives so many people there? And what gets people to keep coming back? I love that question. I love how you phrased it. Uh, Thank you. Because, no, it's true, Matt, because... What you're seeing, and how many times have you been to the Cafe du Monde? I, I can't count. I can't count. That many. I mean, all I know is that I have to make sure that I'm wearing a white T-shirt that day. Right, because it's going to be a big <laughs> mess. Yeah. So if we were in a courtroom, I could introduce evidence that would suggest you, Matt Lyles, you are an expert witness on Cafe du Monde. I'll take it. Yes. This is right out of my cousin Vinny, right? Can yeah. we enter the <laughs> enter the courtroom as an expert witness? The two you know, youths. I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two youths, right? Identical, make and model top. Anyway, so I've been there on several occasions, but I think you've probably been there more than I have. All right. But will you, you know, for the judge and jury and our listening audience, can you confirm, sir, that consistently Cafe Dumont has longer lineups? and is swarming with customers at a degree much higher than all of their competitors. Absolutely, Your Honor. Every day. There. So they've got the lineups. True? Yes, sir. 
So again, what are we really studying? And I'll take people deep into the book of what we're really studying is we're talking about lineups. Cafe Dumont has the lineup. The other companies, let's just say ABCD, uh, the other companies might have great products. Matt, but do they have the lineups? No. No, no, no. So, so what fascinates us is what creates the lineup. When Apple releases a brand new phone, what do you see? People are camped out, not just lined up, they camp out for it. When was the last time anyone pitched a tent, camped out in the rain, and waited for the latest Acer release? No, <laughs> no, no, no. And that's not to diminish what Acer is as a company or their products. But if we're talking brand and identity and reputation, Apple wins hands down a million, no, two trillion times over. They win. Make sense? It absolutely does. And if you were to talk to people from a rational point of view, right, you would say that, okay, Apple's phones and the features that they offer in their phone, a lot of times those features have been available in other competitors' phones for the past one to two years. Other competitors' phones might have a better performing and lower cost phone. Right. But nobody lines up for those phones. Right. Which means what we're really exploring is a world of gravitas. Yeah. Yeah of allure, of mystique, shall we say, je ne sais quoi, (laughs) like whatever it is, something with cachet. That's what we're looking at, aren't we? Cafe Dumont has cachet and gravitas that the other coffee shops don't. Apple does the same thing. This is why all of this, to me, is so parallel. The size of the business, Fortune 100 or a small to medium-sized business in Nashville, Tennessee. For me, it's all about how do you create the the lineup, online or off. And so to your point with Cafe Dumas, since you brought it up, what you are witnessing every time you see that lineup, and you can think of other ones. I bet, Matt, if I put you on the spot, you could think of some other lineups, right? Hattie B's Hot Chicken in downtown Nashville. Right. Every time you see that lineup or the lineups for rides at Disney, right? Just think of all the lineups. Every time you're seeing that, you're seeing something we call the Mona Lisa effect. That's what it is. Explain that. What is the most famous painting in the world? It's the Mona Lisa. Right. Now, I gave away the punchline a little bit, but it doesn't matter right. because, because I'll never forget when I first kind of stumbled onto this, and it, it's chapter one of the book, okay, is understanding da Vinci and the art of the steel. To decode the Mona Lisa effect redefines how brand building works in the 21st century. So how many paintings and artifacts do you think there are in the Louvre in Paris? Oh, there's uh, there's like 30-something thousand, right? Bingo. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, there's there's 35,000. Forgive my pronunciation. If they're in the Louvre, Louvre, yeah. the Louvre. The uh, Louvre, yes. <laughs> if they're in there, they're not poor, crappy paintings either. These are yeah. 35,000 of the best of the best. You just stole my line, which is I, how I'm, I'm, many, I'm so right? No, it's okay, Matt. How many world-class paintings are in the Louvre? They're all world, all of them, 35,000 of them are world-class. There may be one in there that just happens to be put in there because somebody's uncle was the curator at that time. (laughs) Maybe. But my point is that for anyone who's been there and seen this dynamic, they will instantly know what I'm talking about. When you wander through all the galleries, and that's what I find fascinating about the Louvre, you could never cover it in one day. It's massive. But if you wander through the galleries, you will stand before some breathtaking works of art. They are truly magnificent. And you'll be the only person. And you've got it all to yourself and you're drinking in the beauty. It could be from Rembrandt. It could be from Van Gogh. It could be from whoever the artist is. And These are majestic pieces of art. We're all world-class, but you'll be the only person. Those galleries are empty. 
You turn the corner and there's one gallery, Matt, just one. And we're talking the mob rules. This is Black Sabbath 1982 circa Ronnie James Dio has replaced Ozzy as the lead singer. <laughs> it's the mob. And they're just crammed and jammed in there trying to see this little 30 by 21 painting, this portrait from the 16th century. It was the last visit to the Louvre when I realized the museum itself is a metaphor for the market. That's the market. How many realtors are there in Nashville? How many car dealerships are there? How many? Do the math. How many lawyers are there in Chicago? Right? Yeah, countless. Right. Anyone can do this. In the Louvre, it's the metaphor for the market, for any overcrowded competitive market where you're looking for attention. How do you explain this? Where one painting gets all the attention all the time and everybody else, even though they're world class, are settling for the leftovers and the breadcrumbs. Explain that one. Yeah, because I don't think... If I look at the Mona Lisa and I've never seen it in person, the museum was closed when I visited Paris. I think they were on strike, but I've never seen it in person, but I've seen it. And if I were to see it alongside other paintings, to me, there's nothing that really stands out as being that much more remarkable, that much more special than other paintings. So why is it that that's the most famous one that everyone lines up to? Right. And that's why it's chapter one, because that sets the reader off on a great journey of discovery. And we can actually pinpoint the day when everything changed. Like I said, when the world shifted and tilted on its axis. And what happened was before this day, Matt, the Mona Lisa was regarded, but not this overwhelming slam dunk favorite. And I think she's the perfect metaphor for what every business leader wants. I know you've heard it in your career. I know anyone listening today, wouldn't they love to be top of mind in their category? Top of mind. Top of mind, right? The top of mind. That's what happened to the huggable car dealer. He's top of mind. And so the Mona Lisa is that in the world of paintings. But we wanted to know what happened. When did everything change? And the pattern, if you will, is very consistent. All 12 chapters uh, reveal, and I won't give it away, so I want people to enjoy the book and enjoy the journey. But I'll tell you what happened for the Mona Lisa, Matt, and your listeners. It was August 21st, 1911. That's when it changed. Because 110 until, years ago, right? Yeah, up until then, While the Mona Lisa was regarded, even the art critics thought da Vinci's other masterpiece, The Last Supper, had more, shall we say, artistic merit. Other painters, Renoir, and like I say, Rembrandt, Monet, Van Gogh, they were all recognized. But what happened? And what happened, very quickly, the Mona Lisa was stolen. It was an inside job. An Italian handyman named Vincenzo Perugia walks out. Broad daylight, early Monday morning, with the Mona Lisa tucked under his smock. Imagine this for a second. Here's how not famous she was at the time. It takes the officials at the museum a good 30 to 48 hours before they even know she's missing. Oh, my goodness. You can't even imagine that, can you? (laughs) Wow. Can you picture this scene, Matt? Did someone put her somewhere? Yeah. The Mona Lisa's missing. Which one is that? Yeah, exactly. And so when they noticed that she was missing and they notified the authorities, what happened was the media picks up the story. Now, picture what mass media looks like in 1911. There's only one platform, not like today. Right. So everything from today is now Google, Facebook, YouTube is all wrapped up in one platform in 1911 called the newspaper. And they were printing newspapers all over the world. So she hits front page in Paris. And guess what? That image and that story went from Paris to Pittsburgh to Pensacola, Florida, to Lima, Peru. She's everywhere. 
It's the story of the greatest art heist in history. And so for a two-year news cycle, I just want you to picture, Matt, she's getting millions upon millions and millions and millions of dollars of free publicity that no painting ever got before or since. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Now, what happens in the interim? Would you believe in 1911 there was conspiracy theories? <laughs> oh, they've always been around. Yeah, there was scandal back then. The chief of police in Paris resigns. Why? Why did he step down? What about some of the suspects? Picasso was called in for questioning. See, people are doing wow, and they're writing all kinds of letters to the editors, right? It's it's a national disgrace. France, can you picture this, Matt? France has been insulted, right? I mean, it just goes, oh my goodness, yeah. Two years later, Perugia tries to sell it to an art dealer in Florence, Italy, and that's when he got caught. She does a two-week tour of her Italian homeland. And now, picture, when she's coming back home, think about that story that's hitting the papers. The return yeah, of the, the homecoming. Yeah. 120,000 people are there waiting to see her come back home. Wow. She left unknown. She returned as a top of mind legend didn't she and it's just stayed top of mind oh, yeah my point is what happens just imagine matt and i want your listeners to imagine this what happens if vincenzo perugia walks out that morning with a different painting which painting are we talking about to this day yeah whatever he stole that's the most famous painting bingo that's the one that has irreplaceable value. That's the one that more than 10 million people visit the Louvre for every single year. That's the legend. What I teach in my keynotes and different workshops and things that we do with folks, it's very, very simple. Art without a story is just paint on a canvas. A business without a story, just like every other business. Yeah. It's that simple. And that's where I think what we talked about earlier is so important in terms of being able to discover, tell, and live your own story. And so the book is an, a deeper exploration of how the Mona Lisa effect plays out in all of these different categories. But now it makes sense when you look at that lineup of Cafe Du Monde or the lineup of the people uh, buying the new Apple phones. The legend's been built over generations. They no longer know why it was started in the first place. Only that's where I got to go. Yeah. Nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. You got it. That's an amazing story. And I know that there's a lot more to the story and a lot more to the Cafe Du Monde story. So I don't want to spoil it all. I want people to actually go and get the book to read those stories because they are fascinating, along with all the other, uh, I think, 10 other stories that are in the book. Here, I've got one last question for you. Is this the question, the question that you've been dying to ask throughout this conversation? The one I've been dying to ask. Absolutely. Turns out, I think there's a pretty cool answer for it. But if you were to create a five song soundtrack for Big Little Legends, what songs would you include? That's a great question, but I've actually already created that. We just haven't uploaded it to Spotify yet, but here's some selections that I think your listeners would really enjoy today. So number one, Unchained, is from side two of Van Halen's classic Fair Warning album, the fourth album. Unchained, I want you to picture, if you're fascinated by Big Little Legends, be like a latter-day David Lee Roth leaping off the drum riser in that video from Oakland in 1981. Do some stretches first. Yeah, exactly. Don't hurt yourself, right? Song number two is Stairway to Heaven. Oh, wow. Stairway to Heaven, because that to me is so metaphorically true for what we're trying to do. In other words, if there's a bustle in your marketing hedgerow, don't be alarmed now. There's still time to change the road you're on. 
That's true. What Stairway to Heaven speaks to, in my view, uh, Matt, is will your shadow be taller than your soul? I think there's great wisdom from Stairway to Heaven in that respect. Song number three is really going to surprise you. You ready for it? It's about knowing your story. And this is the song that talks about stepping into your story. Nobody else's. Because there's one thing about your story. It's the truth. You know your story. And deep down, people know. For me, it's Deep Purple. Greatest story in rock ever told. Smoke on the water. Yes. Because what happened? They were out in Switzerland for a recording session. They got to make the Machine Head album. And the place where they were going to record the album burnt down. We all came out to Montra on the Lake Geneva shoreline. Listen to those lyrics. And you'll know they just told the story of what actually happened to them. Yeah, it's right there. They're just explaining it right there. Right there. Song number four, completely out of left field, Scotland the Brave. Oh, Scotland wow. the Brave. What? Yeah. Why is that? Yeah, because that honors my dad in St. Andrews, Scotland. There you go. So the book starts at the Louvre in Paris, France. But through the 12 chapters, the ending, and I won't give it away, the ending is at the old course, the home of golf, St. Andrews, Scotland. I am the son of a former pro golfer who was born seven minutes from the first tee in St. Andrews. Yeah. I for love the golfer, that. Yeah. For the golfer, Matt, St. Andrews is Mecca, Bethlehem, and the Vatican all rolled up into one. And my dad is 82 years old. He still walks 18 holes without a power cart. And so we've had a lot of fun with dad these last several years because he's still out trying to improve his game and win the next big tournament that he wants to enter. So number four is Scotland the Brave. And number five is this. We did uh, the David Lee Roth version of Van Halen. It's only appropriate right now. Mm. Like now. Don't wait. Now. If any of what we're talking about resonates with you, do it now. That's it. Because if you act on your emotion, there's a better chance you're actually going to do something about it and close that gap between the knowing and the doing. Geez, I should do that someday. No, do it now. Don't wait. That's it. If you do it right now, then you recognize that it doesn't have to be perfect. You're just moving. You're moving forward toward That's it. that aspirational idea that you have. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. I love this soundtrack. This is great. Very inspirational. Man, Gear, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Gear, I've learned a lot from you. I've learned a lot from your book, but where can people go to learn more? Uh, GareMaxwell.com. Matt, thank you for that. I'm the easiest guy to find on the internet. We've got a book site, BigLittleLegends.com, but GareMaxwell.com. It's Gear, G A I R. You're on the air with Gear. used to have hair, but yeah, it's garemaxwell.com. And we do a series, uh, Matt, called Leaders and Legends, where every second Wednesday, we're posting original material. So it's not just this book. We're always publishing stories of leaders and legends because uh, we happen to believe that the greatest brands in the world were built by great leaders, not marketing companies, not consultants, that leadership and brand reputation is tied. They go together like ham and eggs. Absolutely, yeah. It is fascinating to see where these big name brands really came from. And they always have a great origin story. Love it. Well, Gear, thank you so much for being here today. I really enjoyed this one. Right back at you. It's been a lot of fun. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping when uh, we get back to Nashville someday, we'll be able to hook up and sample some of that fine hot chicken. I will treat you to some Hattie B's. <laughs> Thanks again. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Gare Maxwell. So go ahead, check out his book, Big Little Legends. It's out this week. It's going to help you and your team learn how to create experiences that'll turn your customers into loyal fans. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it a lot simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Anthony Iannarino. Anthony is an international keynote speaker and the founder and CEO of B2B Sales Coach and Consultancy. 
It's a boutique sales coaching and consulting firm where they provide individual and corporate training to sales teams. And he's the author of The Lost Art of Closing, The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need, and Eat Their Lunch. Anthony and I discuss his lessons on winning, developing, and managing client relationships. And while Anthony approaches his lessons from a sales perspective, they're actually valuable for anyone that needs to build relationships in their career. Hey, I think that includes you too. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Anthony's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple.